437 in your hymnal 437 since the savior found me pardon all my sin i'm saved 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 let's stand together as we sing 437 together <clears throat> on that first since the savior found me pardon all my sin i have had the joy and living hope within god is all the same and sorrow of the past they're underneath the precious blood of christ and lust. i'm saved 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 i'm happy all the way saved 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 i love him more he's saved 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 i know he's mighty charm he saves and keeps and sanctifies me by his power since the savior singing and uh, aren't you glad you're saved uh, he saves and keeps and sanctifies me by his power save 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 happy on the way and uh, boy if you're happy on the way let your face know about it all right and uh, let's be happy on the way good to see you in church tonight thanks for making the effort to be here and uh, let's open with a word of prayer shall we father we thank you for the privilege to be here tonight thank you lord for each one who's made their way here for the service this evening we lift up those unable to be here tonight because of illness and sickness, and I pray your healing hand upon them, and Lord, strengthen them, raise them up to be back with us very, very soon. And Lord, we do bow before you at the beginning of this service and ask you to meet with us tonight, that you would speak to our hearts, you, you know our needs, and I pray you administer to those needs tonight as only you can. Uh, Lord, you do what only God can do in our midst this evening is our prayer. Lord, be with the music and our fellowship together. And once again, please honor the preaching of the Word of God. And we'll thank you for it, for we do ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Number 11 in your hymnal. Number 11, long before the fall of man, God designed a master plan. He is mine. <clears throat> Let's sing that first all together. Long before the fall. Yeah. 
singing tonight now listen carefully we've got some announcements need your attention um let's see tomorrow night ladies don't forget uh your ladies night out now uh you signed up for your uh, subways down there and what you wanted and uh you have to understand now we order that tomorrow morning all right so if you ordered it and you don't show up you pay for your sandwich, okay? And uh, someone else may eat it, but you're going to pay for it, all right? And uh, you just, once you're on, you're on, man, and uh, there's no turning back, amen? And uh, you'll have a great time together tomorrow night with the subways, and I think you're going to have some games and such, so you'll have a good time together. Ladies' night out tomorrow night at 6.30. There's still time to sign up down there if you'd like to. Uh, you can do that in the foyer. Now, uh, also, don't forget the family conference with the Knickerbockers, which is down at Lancaster Baptist Church in Lancaster, Ohio. Uh, that's Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and then they have a banquet on Thursday night, all right? And if you can make one of those nights, go down there and be there with the Knickerbockers. I know they'd love to see uh, anybody from Bible Baptist, and uh, you can see me for directions and such to the church or Jan Proke, either one, all right? And uh, then Wednesday night, we'll have our midweek service right back here, our Bible study this uh, Wednesday evening, Josiah's on the loose, all right? <laughs> Passed up his row there. The, um, uh, what, what stops God from answering our prayers? What, what hinders our prayers from getting answered? We'll study that on Wednesday night for our Bible study. And uh, then Thursday night, of course, the RU Inside down at the prison. 45 on Thursday night down there. Uh, 30, let's see, 35 returning guys, only 10 new guys, I think. The NCAA tournament held them down a little bit. I think they must have a TV in there somewhere. And so some of them didn't have as many new guys as we normally have. But uh, we did have uh, five. Is that right, Bob? Five that trusted Christ their Savior. And uh, we had one graduate, again, one way all the way through the program. And he's graduated now. And, uh, and this particular fella, uh, which is uh, going to be a help to us, uh, he's serving four years. And he's serving it right at CRC. So he'll be with us for the next four years uh, coming down there on Thursday night so that'll be a that'll really be a help and uh, we'll be able to utilize him to help us out so uh, we praise the Lord for that then of course Friday night are you right here in the auditorium with uh, our normal performers unanimous then Saturday uh, bus soul, bus visitation and soul winning here in the auditorium at 10 uh, from 11 to 3 on Saturday is the uh, third annual three-on-three -three tournament over here at Urban Crest three-on-three uh, -three basketball tournament and uh, we encourage you to uh, go over and support that and be there for the for the outreach that that is and uh, there's refreshments and such and uh, you'll and you'll have a good time and uh, go over there and support the uh, brother Andy and the teenagers there as they reach out to try to reach some high school kids for the Lord amen, amen. and so that's from 11 to 3 on Saturday all right and then of course uh, that's going to bring us right up to next Sunday, which is Palm Sunday, and then into the uh, Easter week, which uh, Resurrection Sunday, remember, Saturday night at 6 p.m. on the 4th, and Sunday night on the 5th is Lift Him Up, the uh, cantata and drama, and uh, we look forward to that, and then uh, another date to put down that isn't on our church calendar, something that uh, we've just arranged, we have a gospel quartet coming to sing on April 18th, uh, it's called the Down East Boys. I'm not familiar with that group. There's, a, there's a, some folks who come on Sunday morning. They sat right in the back row, right where the rivers are this morning. They sat there this morning, and uh, he, he knows these fellas and said they're good guys and good testimonies, and we'd really enjoy them if they come. And so 
we contacted them and they they come on a free will offering basis and so uh we're gonna have a first time for us to do something like this but uh looking forward to it and some of you really enjoy the uh quartet southern gospel music and so we'll have that on saturday april 18th at 6 p.m all right right here in the auditorium so write that down date down and uh tell your other folks about it uh friends and family you know throughout the area and uh, let them know we'll have that concert for them on April 18th. All right? That's a lot. Hope you got it. And uh, those are the announcements. And uh, it'll be amazing how many times we'll announce stuff, and then someone will say, I never heard that before. When, when did you talk about that? And uh, so it's, uh, I hope you were listening and you got all that. All right? Looking around to see anybody. Good to have the Chaffins here this evening. Good to see Dave and Ivanya and Travis and his significant other there, Tara. Good to see you guys here tonight, man. Looking good. Good to see you. Trav, you're getting ready to graduate? Just a couple months away, right? Yeah. That's what your parents said. Thank the Lord. They're praying, praying you through anyway. Amen. <laughs> All right. Do you know? You have any plans yet? Do you know what you're going to do? College football? Where, do you know where? You're kidding. We have a fellow who comes. We have a fellow who comes here every Sunday morning. Rick is his name, and he works down at the in Campbellsville, Kentucky, at the, that university. Yeah, no kidding. I'll have to give you his name and everything. Get contact with him. Yeah, amazing thing. Small world. How about that? Congratulations. That'd be great. That'd be great. Hey, man. Good to see y'all tonight. Thanks for being here. All right. Let's hear from the choir.
193193. I traveled alone upon this lonesome way, Jesus and me. 193 together. Let's sing that first. I traveled alone upon this lonesome way. My burdens were heavy and dark with my day. I looked for a friend that he, but all of the time, been looking for me. Now it is Jesus and me. Let's all stand together as we sing number 507 together. Come thou fount. On that first all together. Come thou fount. Somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together.
my good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Let's sing that last together. Let's sing it like we mean it. Oh, to grace how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Let's sing that last together as you find your seats. Oh, to grace how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. You can be seated. Ushers will come. We'll get our offering tonight. Um, we are, let's see, we had $332 Wednesday night towards the park for the bus that we're getting repaired. And um, let me see how about three, 391, I think, came in. 390 came in this morning, or 389. We're right about 711, and uh, that's come in. So uh, we're, we're, we're getting close to taking care of the part, plus the batteries and the starter and the other things that, that came in. Brother Don, do you want to say something? Can I say that just for me to help out? Well, certainly. <laughs> it always does it always does that's all right but the labor price is right all right and uh and really these guys have uh i'm not exaggerating when i know brother taylor i'm i'm sure has put 40 hours in on that already and brother campbell many many hours as well and uh it's just uh we appreciate those men and their labor and uh it's just uh, beginning, they're getting everything tore apart and ready so when it comes in, they can put it on. In fact, Brother Dave, the bus is down there in Mount Sterling. At the the guy who took our old bus, the has a big junkyard down there. It, it quit on 71 down there is where this turbocharger in the engine gave out. And they limped it over to his place, and that's what's sitting there. And uh, so it's down there, and he's he's been a real blessing to us. It's really been great to be able to have a place to put it. And, not have to get it towed all the way back here to church, <laughs> so that's been uh, it's great. And uh, but thank you for giving towards that. And if you can uh, help us out uh, to continue to get that bus in tip-top shape, uh, if that part gets in here, these guys are ready to get it on. And uh, we, Lord willing, we'll have that thing running by Sunday. So uh, appreciate you giving to help that out. All right, let's pray for the offering tonight, Brother Andy. Father, we're so glad to be in your house tonight. Lord, you're good to us. We thankful, we are thankful for the blessings that we get every day from you. Thankful tonight to be in your house with the people of God and the people of like faith. And we're just thankful for the, ser the song that we sang, to lift your name up. Lord, I pray that you would meet our needs tonight, Father, with this bus. Lord, the bus ministry is such a vital ministry and reaching families for you and 
seeing changed lives. Thank you for the bus ministry, Lord. Would you just provide the funds now and help us to give with cheerful hearts to meet this need. And may you see to it that this bus gets fixed and on the road Sunday, God. We trust you for it. Bless this offering now and each gift and each giver alike. And open our hearts now for the preaching to come. And we'll thank you for it and give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Take your Bibles this evening to James chapter 5, if you would please. James chapter 5. We are going to read verses 13 through 18. Verses 13 through 18 of James chapter 5. We'll read them responsibly. I'll, I'll begin on 13, then you join me on 14, and I'll read 15, and we'll alternate like that. So we'll end together on verse number 18 of James chapter 5. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word, and I'll begin on verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing to the reading of the scripture. Now this evening, Lord, we thank you so much for already the good service we've had together, the wonderful music and the, the songs that we've been able to sing. It's lifted our hearts to thee. Now, Father, we thank you for the fellowship one with another. We thank you tonight for the Bible and for giving us your word and preserving it for us that we hold copies in our hand tonight. And I pray, Lord, you bless the special now and use it to continue to tune our hearts to yours. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. That's weary, tending a load of care. Are you a soul that's seeking rest from the burden you bear? Do you know, my Jesus, do you know? Bye. 
Father, we bow before you in prayer and thank you, Lord, for being our God. Thank you for sending your Son to be our Savior. Lord, we're thankful we're saved this evening. and We're thankful that we're your children. And we come before you tonight and admitting we're needy people and we need to hear from our God this evening. I pray you'd bless the and honor the preaching of the Word of God tonight. Lord, once again, I pray that the Holy Spirit would do His work in our midst. Please move up and down these aisles and in and out of the rows and stop at every occupied seat and minister to your people tonight as only you can. Lord, I pray that we'll be able to leave the building in a little bit saying it was good to have been in the house of the Lord and that God met with us this evening. So Lord, help us to focus. Uh, There's many things that would capture our mind and cause us to wonder and think on other things during the message and I pray that you'd Help each of us to stay focused and not miss what you would want to say to us this evening. Help me as I bring the message, and please help the folks as they listen. And God, I'll thank you in advance for what I believe you'll do tonight. Amen. The James chapter 5, if your Bible's back open there, we're going to spend some time here looking at this passage of Scripture. James is all about our faith being tested. And if your faith is going to be worth anything, it has to be tested. James says, I'll show you my faith by my works. Uh, James is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. And in James 5 alone, uh, we see if you read James 5, you'll see our faith is being tested by riches. Our faith is going to be tested by the return of Christ. Our faith is going to be Uh, Tested in what we'll see here this evening uh, in our circumstances of life and even in sickness and illness. The key to handling any situation properly is prayer. The key to handling any situation properly is prayer. E.M. Bounds said this, when the church, what the church needs today is not better machinery, not new organizations, Not more and novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. The Holy Ghost does not flow through methods, but through men. He does not come upon machinery, but upon men. He does not anoint plans, but men, men of prayer. And so we're going to look at the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. The Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. 
Now, when we look at this passage on prayer, we're going to kind of work our way up to that verse. And uh, so some of it's going to kind of be a, a long introduction and then a, a short message and then you'll get to go home, all right? So let's, let's look at where, what it talks here about prayer. And there are several areas that are addressed regarding prayer. The first area addressed is our circumstances. What circumstances do we pray? Notice verse 13. Is there any among you afflicted? Let him what? Pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. So first of all, if you're afflicted, that affliction, by the way, refers back to verses 10, 11, and 12. Look there, if you will. Notice, take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You've heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. He's talking about enduring affliction. Referring to, by the way, stress. Referring to difficulties. What do you do when you're faced with what some call tough situations? What do you do when some people say when you're just faced with stressful circumstances of life? Someone said, when in danger, when in doubt, run in circles, scream and shout. Does that, I hope that doesn't describe you when you get into difficult situations. That may obviously take up some energy, but I doubt it will change your problem at all. It won't solve anything. Someone said, when adversity strikes, there can be four reactions. There can be a physical reaction, and that, by the way, can be anything from screaming and yelling to weeping and working yourself up. In fact, you can even put yourself in the hospital over worry, over stress. The second reaction is to grumble and complain. The children of Israel were experts at it. Just read the book of Numbers. They were constantly grumbling and complaining about their situation. Number three, you can get bitter and blame God. People do that all the time. There are many people who are away from God tonight and won't darken the door of a church because at some point in their life they felt like God should have done something that in their mind He did not do and therefore they want nothing to do with God. They blame God for their circumstances. He's unloving, he's unfair, he doesn't care, whatever it may be. But the fourth reaction, and I hope this would be the reaction of believers here tonight, and that is you can pray. You can pray. Be more desirous to meet God in your trouble than to have God get you out of the trouble. Be more desirous to meet God in the trouble then you are to be desirous to have God get you out of the trouble. In fact, God oftentimes sends adversity to us just to have us pray. So we'll look to Him. It's interesting, isn't it? So often when we get into difficulties, we get into trials, we tend to run to everything else, and when all that's exhausted, we say, well, I guess I can pray. And it seems to be the last resort instead of the first place we turn. Pray. What do you pray for, preacher? You pray for grace, that God will give you the sufficiency and the ability to uh, take what comes. Don't, don't, don't think God, God never gives me more than I can handle. He will give you more than you can handle, so you'll learn to rely on Him. But ask for grace. And then ask for wisdom. Wisdom for what? Wisdom to know, God, what are you trying to teach me through this trial? What are you trying to teach me in this situation? What are the lessons that I need to learn? And so we pray when we are afflicted. Now, there's an opposite end of the spectrum that deals in verse 13. First, he talks about afflicted. We said that's stressful, that's tough circumstances. Then he goes to the other extreme and he says, Is anybody merry? Let him sing psalms. Now he goes to the opposite and says, Who's happy? Is anybody happy? Is anybody glad? Is anybody uh, joyful? Here's what you ought to do. You ought to sing to the Lord. And, and it's interesting. You go from affliction to being merry. And the only, the only thing in between affliction and merry is you prayed. 
Isn't that interesting? That's how you got. You say, oh, I don't know how I can handle it. I've got so much going on in my life. I'm not sure I can make it another day. Well, you need to pray. You need to pray. And when you pray, God will turn that prayer, He'll turn that affliction, He'll turn that into being joyful and being merry. It's, it's, the, it's the same thing that happened to Paul and Silas. Remember when they were put in prison in Philippi, gotten beaten for preaching the gospel? Imagine that, imprisoned and in stocks and have stripes across your back simply because you told people about Jesus. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And they could have been molly grubbing it. I'm sorry, that's a real deep word, isn't it? And um, they, they could have just been feeling sorry for themselves and having a pity party. But they didn't. By the way, it says at midnight they prayed. And once they prayed, what happened? They began to sing. Their affliction turned to merriment. And their affliction turned to joy. And, and prayer changed that. Because when you pray, you get God's perspective on things. And you get to see God, how God views it, not just how you view it. And so they begin to praise the Lord. There's always two outlets for our feelings in any circumstances. That is prayer and praise. Prayer and praise. All right? So that's the first area that, that we, we learn over three areas of prayer. The second one is verse 14. Here's our second area. And that is, is any sick among you... Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So the second area is sickness. And probably no other area in the work of God is counterfeited as much as this area is. Healing. Divine healing. And I would say this. People who claim to be divine healers today are not near as divine as they make themselves out to be. <clears throat> Their healings are not as Jesus healed people. Let me give you three characteristics of any healing that Jesus did, all right? Number one, it was instantaneous. It was instantaneous. When Jesus healed somebody, buddy, they were healed uh, immediately. It wasn't a gradual thing. It wasn't a, a, a eventual thing. They were healed immediately. When he healed Peter's wife's mother of her fever, the Bible says she got up and ministered unto them. I mean, she was, she was good right away, and she was made whole. Instantaneous. Number two, it was complete. It wasn't a, a gradual thing where, well, okay, uh, the lame man uh, at the pool of Bethesda, rise, take up your bed and walk. The Bible didn't say, well, they kind of got up and stumbled a little bit and just kind of held on to people for a while. No, he got up and walked away after, after 38 years of laying that way. Okay? Miraculous, not, not gradual, instantaneous, incomplete, and by the way, permanent. Permanent. It, it never again, uh, they didn't have to repeat it. Okay, It was permanent. I remember when I was a teenager reading a magazine my mother had come to the house. I don't know if it was Good Housekeeping or it was some kind of magazine like that. And they had done an article on Catherine Kuhlman. Anybody heard of Catherine Kuhlman? Uh, she was a woman faith healer from back in the 60s and early 70s. And would, would hold the crusades, and she was kind of, she probably would have been a Joyce Meyer of her day, all right? You might know that name. And um, here she was, and, and they, what they, all they did was they went to crusades, they made note and documented who went up forward and who supposedly got a healing, and then at six months and a year later, they went back and followed up on those people to see how they were doing, if they still were completely healed. And in their documentation that they had, they did not find one person that was still healed six months later. Not one. In fact, in some cases, they were worse than what they were. They got an adrenaline rush. They got uh, some sort of emotional uh, rush that, that during that meeting, and they could get up and walk, or they'd get up and do something, but they ended up doing more damage than what they had before they went to the meeting. Now, that's why the characteristics of those who heal people today, the faith healers, if you notice, oftentimes it's gradual, it's partial, and it's temporary. If, if, if Think about this. If somebody really said they had the gift of healing and they could heal people, 
then when I come to, the, to, come to a place, if I came to Columbus, I, I wouldn't just have a meeting in a church or in a stadium. I would, I would visit Ohio State. Hospital. I would visit Riverside. I would visit Doctors West. I'd clean the hospitals out. Why not go heal everybody? And you could do that. By the way, when they when Jesus came to town, remember they brought unto him all that were sick and diseased, and the Bible says he healed them. He healed them. That's Bible healing, and that's that's certainly what. what, what what's the what's the the, the 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 procedure? What should you do when you're sick? Notice what it says: Is any sick among you? Here's what you do. You call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him or you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have committed sins, he sh they shall be forgiven him. So here's, here's the order that you follow. And by the way, God is a God of order. And so here's the order. First thing you do when you're sick, you call for the elders. That would be the pastors of the church or the, the, the more mature men of the congregation. And, and you notice, it doesn't say the pastor or the elders have to go find the sick. It said the sick should let the elders know and let the pastors know. Can I, can I say this? When you are sick, it's your responsibility to let the church know you're sick. So, well, I was sick and nobody called me. Well, did you tell anybody you were sick? See, don't you get upset about that if you didn't tell anybody you were sick. We shouldn't have to put on the FBI hats and go searching out to see who's, who's ill and who isn't. The, the Scripture says your responsibility is to let the church know that you are sick. That's your responsibility. And, and so the first step is with the sick. You call and notify the, the uh, pastors of the church. Then it says the pastor or the elders will come and pray over the sick. Now prayer comes in. All right? And they take the case to the great physician. All right? And, and, and you take it to the throne of grace. Now, I want to make it clear. The pastor doesn't heal, and the elders don't heal. Notice what it says. It says, they'll pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. It all talks about the prayer of faith and the Lord raises them up. So the Lord does the healing. It is not the, 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 the elders don't heal. The elders do not deliver. God does that. Now three, notice they anoint with oil in the name of the Lord. Oil is simply a symbol of the Holy Spirit of God. It's not the oil that heals. It's God that heals. It's the prayer of faith that saves the sick. It's not the oil or the absence of the oil. It's the prayer of faith. God rewards faith. He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. I've mentioned before about uh, people in time past and a lady with a cracked hip and, and, and she called for the elders and we prayed and, and did the x-ray before they were supposed to do surgery and there's no crack in her hip anymore. God healed her. God took care of that. There was another lady who, who had lost her voice and the doctors didn't know what to do and she came and asked us to anoint her with oil and pray over her in the name of the Lord and, and, and God gave her her voice back. God can do things like that. God's still in the healing business. Listen, God hasn't changed. If God healed then, God will still heal now. But we must do it His way, and we must follow His procedure for doing it. And there are several in this room that, that have went, went under illness and with cancer and, and other things have called for the elders of the church, and we've prayed for them, and they're here tonight because God healed them, and God has taken care of them. God, the, the prayer of faith still saves the sick. All right? So the, it's the prayer of faith. Modern healers want to blame the person. If they're not healed, they want to blame them for their lack of faith. But this passage says nothing about their, the, the person who needs healing. It doesn't say anything about their faith. It says it's the prayer of faith that will heal the sick. And God will raise them up. It's not the sick person's faith. It's the praying people's faith. Remember in Mark chapter 2 when the four fellows had a friend who was paralyzed and they wanted to get him to Jesus and they came born of four. That's where they broke the roof up and let him down through the roof. Remember the Bible says something interesting. It says Jesus looked up and he saw their faith. He didn't say anything about the guy on the, you know, the paralyzed guy's faith. But he saw the four friends' faith. 
And, and he rewarded their faith. And that fellow got healed. And that fellow received Christ. And so healing, listen, healing doesn't come in answer to faithless prayer. It's a prayer of faith. Believing that God can and God does heal. Now, let me give you two important thoughts to go along with this. God doesn't heal everybody. God doesn't heal everybody. I want you to hold your finger there in James 5. That's, I'm going to come back to that. But go back to your left to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul is closing the letter here of 2 Timothy. And he's saluting people and saying hello to folks and such. And when he gets down to verse 20 of 2 Timothy 4, he says, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Melitum sick. Wait a minute, Paul, you had to leave somebody behind who was sick? Huh? Why, why wouldn't you just touch him? And In fact, wasn't, wasn't that a case in, in Paul's ministry when... Uh, they just had a handkerchief or something from Paul, and they touch it, and they were made whole. I mean, they were. If anybody had the the healing power, it would have been Paul. But here, he had to leave a fellow home. He had to leave him sick, because it's not always God's will to heal the sick. And and let me go on to say this: it sickness is not always a result of sin. Don't look at somebody because they've been sick. Oh, yeah, they must have done something wrong. No, you sound like Job's friends. Who you sound like? And, and they were wrong, and so were you. All right? You have no idea. But God doesn't always. In fact, Paul had, we don't know what that thorn in the flesh was, some kind of physical ailment, but he asked God to heal him, and God said no, because you'll rely on my power if you have that weakness. It could have been some physical affliction. It could have been bad eyesight, some weak eyes. But I know this. It was, such a, it was such a situation with his health, he had a physician travel with him. That physician's name was Luke. He had a personal physician that traveled with him on his missionary journeys. When you read the book of Acts and some of the missionary journeys, it's, it's we did this and we set sail and we went there. Why we? Because Luke wrote that and he was there. He went along with them. And so there's, there, it's not always God's will to heal in every case. You think about this. If, if it was always God's will to heal you every time you were sick, no one would ever die. As soon as you get sick, you go somewhere and go, go to the healer and get healed. You'd be, there'd be people in the room tonight, two, three hundred, four hundred years old. Some of you feel like that anyway, but you, you understand? Nobody would ever die. No, we're in sinful bodies. Hey, this body's wearing out, man. I wish it wouldn't, but it is. And, and you can tell it. I was talking to somebody the other day, and older guys at the YMCA, you know, and they're just there, they, they like to talk about all their ailments and the things that are wrong, and say, man, getting old ain't easy, is it? You've got to be tough, because the body wears out, and it's not always God's will to heal everyone. Now, sickness, I said it's not always the result of sin, but it could be the result of sin. Sickness in the Bible was sometimes a result of jealousy. You read about that in Numbers 12. It was a result of rebellion in Numbers 16. It was a result of discontent in Numbers 21. It was a result of abusing the Lord's table in 1 Corinthians 11. Many are sick among you and many are weak. So that's why the Bible says, you know, if he committed sins, they'll be forgiven him. Because when you have sickness, the first thing you want to do is ask God to search your heart to make sure there's nothing there that he's brought this affliction on you for, that he's brought this sickness on you about. It's a time to search your heart. Not, not just for you to search your heart, but ask God to search your heart and see if there be any wicked way in you so you can confess that. Now, go back to James chapter 5. Are you doing all right? Okay, we're, we're moving on. You're doing okay. James 5, please. Notice now the third area. We had the... Circumstances. We have the sickness. And now here's a third area, and this is interesting. It's confessing your faults one to another. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, go back up to verse 15 for a second. It says, The Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. It's all right? So, 
the one who's been healed has already been forgiven of their sins. So now we come to verse 16. It says, confess your faults one to another. It doesn't say confess your sins. Why? They've already been forgiven in verse 15. You don't confess things are already forgiven. You don't confess things are already forgiven. Is this on? You don't confess things are already forgiven. They're gone. It's, it, it's, uh, it's covered by the blood of Christ, and uh, they're never to be brought up again. And faults, if you have a Bible that says confess your sins one to another, you might have a Catholic Bible. I don't know. They, they, they will use, people will use that verse to say you need to confess your sins to somebody else. The Bible never says that. The Bible says you confess your sins to God. You confess your sins to Christ. He's the only one. He, by the way, why can you tell them to Him? Because He already knows it. Okay? No one else has to know that. So you do confess your faults. What are those faults? Well, I, I think it's Hebrews 12. Look, at you're in James. Just go to your left to the book right before James. You should just be three or four pages. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Just go to your left there, three or four pages. Do you see it? Hebrews 12. Notice verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. That's the witnesses, I believe, from Hebrews 11. Notice he says, let us lay aside every, what's the word? Weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now here, we're laying aside the sin, but it makes a, 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 a distinction here between sin and a weight. You know, uh, it, it's really interesting to look up the word weight in the dictionary. Most of you, uh, how many of you are weight conscious? Huh? You, you, you watch your weight. The rest of you are lying. And um, in church yet at that. And, uh, you know, wait, wait, you know what it is? It's, it's the, the, the pull, uh, things that, it, it, it's literally the gravitational pull of your body. And boy, some of us have a lot of pull, amen? amen. And, and, it, and, it, and it's what's pulling you and holding you down. And, and, and that's, that's the weight. Well, wait a minute. That means there's things in our Christian life that pull us down, that keep us from doing what we should do for God. Now, it doesn't say it's sinful, but they're things that weigh us down. And they hurt us. They hinder us in our race, running the race for God. It's, they, they easily beset us. That's what we confess one to another. That we have these things that are pulling us down. It doesn't listen. It doesn't mean that it's sinful. It means that it's not helpful. Paul said, "All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are not helping me." And so I have to realize there's some things in my life that if they're not expedient, if they're not helpful to me, then I need to get rid of them. I need to shed them. I don't need them in my life. And and we have to look at there are things that I think devil would like to have in our life that just hinder us and pull us down and hold us back from doing what we ought to do for God. And you know, best thing, one of the best things you do when you have a situation like that is let somebody else know about it. You say, oh man, then I'll have to do something about it. Yeah, that's right. You see, it, if, you, if, if you keep it to yourself, that's why public decisions are good decisions. You know why? People hold you to it. They'll ask you about that. Hey, how you doing with that? If you just be quiet about it and you just do it yourself, you know what, man? The devil's on you as soon as you get to the parking lot. You can say, man, I'm going to start eating right. I'm going to start doing, doing what I should do and exercising and get myself in condition. And boy, you'll get out the parking lot on Sunday night. You won't tell anybody about it. And you'll get in the car and, man, you'll be thinking French fries. Dairy Queen. Come on. Bring it on, you know. You, you, it's just the way it is. And yet you'll be, listen, if you tell somebody about that, you'll be hesitant to go down to Dairy Queen because you'll say somebody from church is going to walk in there and see me. And it'll help you to do what you should do. Confess your faults one to another. Things that pull us down, things that, that hinder us in our walk. Now here's our statement, and that was all the introduction. Now we're ready for the sermon, okay? Wow. Here it is. Let me, let me turn to James 5. That would be a good thing. 
the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The effectual prayer. Effectual simply means it'll get results. Sufficient to produce a desired result. I don't know about you, but if I'm going to pray, I want to be effectual in prayer. I want to get the desired result in prayer. And that's what Jesus taught. That's, and and that's, how, that's how we live our lives. You heard me say that before. You don't, uh, I've, I've not gone into the restaurant yet and, and ordered something, and the waitress look at me and say, no, nah, you don't want that. No. Uh, I tell you, this is what I want. This is what order. They ask, what do you want? You tell them, and they say, okay. In fact, if they changed it and said, no, you don't want that, you want this, you'd say, no, I really want this right here. You're not going to take no for an answer. You don't, ladies, you don't, you don't go through the grocery, in the checkout line at the grocery store, and the lady starts, you know, boop, 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 and then she puts something aside, doesn't put that in, doesn't put that in, doesn't put that in. You say, man, what are you doing? Say, you don't need this stuff. You say, wait a minute, I don't need this stuff. I know what my family needs. That's what we need. Ring that up. No, 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 you don't need that. You don't, we, we, don't, we don't settle for that in any other of our life, and yet oftentimes we settle for that when we pray. And so, listen, God says effectual prayer gets the desired result. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. We'll say more about that in a minute. Then it says effectual fervent. We've talked about this before. It means heated. It means hot. It means boiling. It, it, it really has to do with our passions. It doesn't mean yelling and screaming. But it does mean you're passionate about what you're praying for. Much of our prayer is pretty unpassionate, if that's a word. You, you just no, no fervor to it. Let me read something to you from the founding of our country. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson were among the delegates meeting at St. John's Church in Richmond, Virginia on March 23rd, 1775, considering a resolution sending Virginia troops into the Revolutionary War. The Virginia House of Burgesses was unconvinced when Patrick Henry rose to speak. And he concluded his speech that day by saying this, What is that gentleman wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. And those in attendance upon hearing the speech began to shout, Give me liberty, or give me death. And that passionate speech is credited with turning the tide. And it's one of the most passionate lines from American Revolution. It changed the course of history. But that reminds me of a passionate prayer prayed about 200 years earlier in Scotland by John Knox who prayed this give me Scotland or else I die give me Scotland or else I die John Knox was described as low in stature and a weakly constitution a contemporary of his said I know not if God ever placed a more godly and great spirit in a body so little and frail when that frail body went to his knees, Mary, the Queen of Scots, trembled. It is said she feared the prayers of John Knox more than the combined armies of Europe. Larry Christensen, in his book, The Christian Family, says, John Knox prayed with such power that all of Scotland was awakened. He writes, Lord, give me Scotland or I'll die. And he prayed with such intensity that the Lord answered his prayer. The fervent, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. A righteous man is very simply, a righteous man is one who does what God says. You're living righteously when you do what God says you should do. Doing what is right in the sight of God. When it says it availeth much, all right, that, that word availeth means it's of great value. Don't you think the effectual, 
fervent prayer of a righteous man is of great value and it is it's of great value to us and to God now the example here given is Elias that's Elijah alright now for this part I want you to go back to 1 Kings chapter 18 this is what it's talking about when it says he was a man subject to like passions as we are hey Elijah was no superman Elijah didn't have a cape and an S on his, you know, chest. He was ordinary. He was just like us. Like passions as we are. And it says, He prayed that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. He prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. 1 Kings 18 is where we read about that story. Let's go there and look at it, and then we'll wrap it up. All right? 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18. Most of you know the story here. He's going against the prophets of Baal. They're going to... They, they've put the sacrifice on the altar. And he's... Uh, whoever, whichever God answers by fire, he'll be God. He, he told the people, if Baal be God, then let's serve him. He said, but if God be God, then let's serve him. What are we doing? What do we do? Okay, we're right here on this end. Why didn't we just go? Go, okay? We've interrupted the service now. Come on. Thank you. He said on, on the mountain there, remember, if God be God, then serve Him. If Baal be God, serve Him. He says, don't be halt between two opinions. Either, either you're going to serve God. And listen, He gave them first crack at it. You remember the story? And they prayed uh, all day long, pretty much. Now listen, Baal is the fire god. Should have been a piece of cake for him. It's a hot day. The sun's beating down. Man, it wouldn't take much. And they are, they, about noontime, they start jumping up and down. And they start cutting themselves. They're crying to their god. And Elijah even makes some fun of them. And he, and he ribs them a little bit. Well, he puts up with it all day long, and it got to be about time for the evening sacrifice, and he said, okay, fellas, I've had enough. Get off of there. And he had them put the altar back together, get things in order. And then he had them bring out the water. That, and, and by the way, that was pretty bold. Not just because you understand whenever you want to start a fire, you don't get everything wet first. But it was pretty bold because it hadn't rained for three and a half years. Water was a pretty precious commodity. And for them to take barrels of water, he said, pour the water on. They poured it on. He said, pour some more on. Poured some more on. Poured another barrel on. Put another barrel on. Until water was everywhere. It filled up the trench around the altar and it was running out on the ground. I'm sure that made a few of them angry. Thought he was wasting the water. Look at verse 36. 1 Kings 18. Verse 36, It came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, here's his prayer, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their back again, turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Then all the people saw it fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah said to them, Take the prophets of Baal and let not one of them escape. And they took them and Elijah brought them down to the book Kidron and slew them there. What a, what a great victory. Notice his prayer. It, by the way, not very long, especially when these guys have prayed for hours. And guess what? He prayed, and he didn't even mention fire. He didn't even command God to throw the fire down, God. He didn't do anything like that. But he prayed passionately. He prayed fervently. And he prays for God to send the fire, and the fire fell. Now it's interesting. The fire falls. He goes down and kills 400 plus 450. I believe he killed 850 prophets of Baal that day. Then he comes to Ahab. Look at verse 41. 
Elijah said to Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there's the sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab got up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up on the top of Mount Carmel, and he cast himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. Now, he goes to Ahab and he says, Ahab, get out of here, go eat your... Hey, Ahab had a big victory banquet plan. Why else would he have all that food there? We're going to celebrate a victory today. I mean, in, in our language, brother, uh, the, the champagne was on the ice for the championship. They were going to win. And guess what? They lost. But he looks at Ahab and kind of orders him. Isn't that amazing? The prophet ordering the king, get out of here and go eat. Because I hear what? The sound of abundance of rain. And there wasn't a cloud in the sky. Wow. That's what he said, though. Now listen. This time, first time, fire coming down from heaven, public prayer. This time, private prayer. This time, when he's going to pray for the rain to come, he doesn't do it in front of anybody. He sends Ahab away, and he goes back up to the top of Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is 1,742 feet above sea level. It's 13 miles inland from the Mediterranean Sea. And they say on a clear day you can see for 100 miles. Notice what he said. He goes down, he casts himself down on the earth and puts his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea, Mediterranean. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again. And the Bible says he went again seven times. Elijah casts himself down, calls out to God privately, nobody there but his servant, and he'll say, all right, go look. Servant, go look, come back, says nothing. Clear as a bell. He keeps praying and he says, go look again. He looks again, comes back, nothing. He keeps praying and says, go look again. He comes back the third time, anything, nothing. He keeps on praying. He comes back, says, go look again. He comes back the fourth time. Nothing. Now, if he'd have been a modern Christian, we'd have said, well, God must have said no. And we'd have quit praying right there, and we'd have said, well, God just said no. I couldn't have that. But he prayed again. Fifth time, no. Sixth time, no. Seventh time, he came back, and you know what he told him? There's one cloud about the size of a man's hand. You understand? That's not real big. You wouldn't, you wouldn't see a cloud about that size in the sky and say, uh-oh, look out. It looks ominous. Huh? But you know what? When he saw that cloud, look what happened. Came to pass at the seventh time, he said, Behold, there rises a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. Oh, look what Elijah said. Go up and say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins, and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Somehow Jezebel was not there on the mountain that day. And, and so Ahab had to go tell her what was going on and what had happened. And so he leaves that day, and, and, and listen, the rain comes. Listen, Elijah went up on the mountain, and by the way, notice it said he cast himself to the ground. He prostrated himself before God. He, he, got, he was alone in the presence of God, and he cast himself down before God to pray. That shows, as we spoke about this morning, his reverence for God. The modern Christian today is more refreshed by upbeat music in a pep rally atmosphere than they are an hour alone with God. He was persistent. It's interesting. He answered the other prayer seemingly immediately. Not a long prayer. Didn't even take up two verses. And bam, fire came down and God answered. This one he had to keep praying. It wasn't just a one-time thing. I think God is, is reminding us again that sometimes you're going to pray and God's going to be gracious. He's going to give it to you right away. 
And other times, you're going to have to be persistent. You're going to have to continue to pray. You're going to have to continue to ask. Effectual, and by the way, the rain came, and listen, it rained. And remember, they hadn't seen rain in three and a half years. What a rain they had. Effectual, fervent prayer. In circumstances, in sickness, confessing our salts, pray effectually, pray fervently, and expect results. Let me share a story with you, and we'll be done. This story circulated in World War I. A British soldier was caught one night creeping secretly back to his tent from a nearby wooded area. He was immediately apprehended and hauled before his commanding officer. He was charged with holding communications with the enemy. The man pleaded that he had just gone into the woods to pray. That was his only defense. Have you been in the habit of spending hours in private prayer, the officer asked. Yes, sir. Then get down on your knees right now and pray like you've never prayed before, was the command. The young man knew he could be shot at sunrise for the crime he was accused of committing. But he knelt down and began to pour his heart and his soul out in prayer. A prayer that became very obvious that was from his heart and obvious that he'd been used to praying. After he prayed for a while, there was a hushed silence and the soldier said, Amen. The officer said, Stand to your feet and said, You may go. I believe your story. The officer said this, If you hadn't drilled often, you couldn't have done so well at your review." The young soldier's prayer, effectual and fervent, saved his life. He was able to pray effectively because he had prepared for some time, even before he knew the challenges he'd face. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Heavenly Father, Take the truth now this evening, Lord. Thank you for the privilege that's ours to pray. Forgive us so often, Lord, as we pray without any passion, without any fervency, without it being effectual, not really expecting results. Forgive us, Lord, for oftentimes saying prayers but not praying. Lord, I pray tonight you would teach us and help us and enable us to be effectual and fervent in our prayers. Lord, you reminded us that Elijah was a man just like us. He was just a human being. The same passions as we have, the same emotions that we deal with, the same temptations that we go through. And I pray we'd learn to pray like he prayed. And I pray you would teach us effectual, fervent prayer that is of great value. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment and we'll have our invitation. wonder how many folks tonight would say, Preacher, God has spoken to my heart tonight about effectual, fervent prayer. Most of us we, we, haven't, we haven't got there in prayer yet. And all I would ask you tonight would be, would you, would you make it your prayer that God would help you to be effectual and fervent in your prayers? It's not something you flip a switch for. It's something you grow into. And God will bring you along to that point. But He won't lead somebody who's not willing. Are you willing to be effectual and fervent in your prayers? God spoke to your heart tonight, and the Holy Spirit of God stopped at your seat. You say, Pastor, the Lord dealt with me tonight in a message. Please pray for me. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Say, that's me this evening. God bless you. Amen. Amen. You may put them down. All our failures are prayer failures. 
It is so effectual. It's such of such great value. Why do you think it is so hard to pray? And the forces of the opposition come against us so much when it's time to pray. Satan knows that prayer moves the hand of God. I don't know about you, but we need prayers answered. We have some big needs that only God can do. We've got some big things that need to be cared for that only God can take care of. We need the effectual, fervent prayer of righteous people. If God has spoken to your heart tonight, I want you to respond to Him. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. Thank you, Lord, for people sensitive to the Spirit of God. And I pray, Lord, that in these next few moments, you'd help each of us to do what you're bidding us do in our heart. And I pray, Lord, as we leave this place in a few minutes and we go to pillow our heads tonight, Lord, before we ever do, we'll find a quiet place alone. And we'll ask you to help us to effectually and fervently pray. Hear our prayer tonight now during this invitation time. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, the pianist will play. As she plays the invitation hymn, Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart tonight. Respond to him, please. I need thee every That's hour. Right. Most gracious Lord. No tender right. voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need thee every hour. In joy or pain, come quickly and abide, or life is vain. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Father, we do need you, not only every hour, but every minute and every moment. And I pray, Lord, we leave this place tonight being very aware that we need you. And I pray that we would in all our ways acknowledge you and let you direct our path. Lord, thank you for meeting with us today. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. Lord, help us to be people of prayer. Help our church to be a place of prayer. Lord, I pray that you'll teach us to be effectual and fervent in our prayers that will avail much from thee. We love you. Thank you for a wonderful day today. Thank you, Lord, for uh, allowing the Chaffins to come in and visit with us tonight. pray your blessing upon them and their family. And, Lord, I pray for Brother Travis as he uh, makes his decision for college. I pray, Lord, you'll open the doors for him and keep him in the will of God. Lord, we pray you'll dismiss us now with your blessing. Make us mindful of your presence as we leave this place tonight. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's sing it together, shall we?
It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go for. It's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed.